Base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's January 17th. It's a Friday. Final week before everybody is back in camp in Major League Soccer. Bunch of USL championship teams getting started as well. It's a busy time of year with lots of news, lots of rumors, lots of you know looking ahead, lots of predictions, lots of stuff going on. We'll try to cover as much of that as we can today. We'll also get into our Friday flashback question. You know, with a, a World Cup coming in 2026 to the United States. Now, it's not going to host the whole thing, but 10 cities are going to host World Cup games, and the overwhelming majority of the games are going to be played in the United States with three Canadian cities, three Mexican cities involved. It's an interesting time to look back at what 1994 was like in the American landscape. Uh, there wasn't much in terms of soccer. Uh, you had a very small professional league. You had a growing grassroots league that, that had some teams that were at a low professional level. You had some semi-pro teams. Uh, that's about it. You didn't have much. You didn't have you know a, a strong women's program in sense of in resources. You had a strong team in terms of performance. They were coming off of a, a World Cup win in '91. But they really weren't thought of enough at that point because there just wasn't much ongoing soccer in 1994. Now, the World Cup coming changed everything. Part of that World Cup coming was Major League Soccer launching. The question on a uh, Friday flashback hashtag is, you know, what are the most impactful things that have happened since that World Cup? You know, and you can take this however you want. I mean, it can be just awareness. It can be specific things starting. It can be specific people. It can be anything you want to take it. It's a, a open-ended question. But I, I think the growth since 94 at times kind of gets overlooked. And potentially the growth after 26, I don't know if we really know what that's going to look like yet. You know, I'm expecting a big bump. I think most people are expecting a big bump. But what does it look like? So let's look back at some of the effects after 94 and say, okay, can you take those ahead and can you build on that or can you see that type of impactful development happen after 26? We'll get into that this morning as well. So tweet us your thoughts, at Soccer Down here. We'll get into it. Uh, we had some stuff at the end of the show yesterday that I think sparked a little bit of conversation. So uh, let's let's go to a Thursday flashback, John. Where were we, and what did we get out of Twitter on it? All right, Matt Wagner. Well, where wanted were we to know first? If, where were we? What are we well, talking was, about with the, these questions? Are they just random questions after yesterday, or are they about certain topics? One was random, and one actually was somewhat prescient. Okay. So the random question from yesterday and uh, comes from Matt Wagner. Have you heard anything about tailgating at Nissan Stadium, and do they have an equivalent to the Gulch? No, I don't think many people have an equivalent to the Gulch. That's kind of unique, but they have tailgating. They've got a lot of lots around that stadium. Um, am I wrong in that, John? Mm -mm. No, but I think that what you do see also is – uh, folks on game day, there's a, a pedestrian bridge that goes across the, the Tennessee River. And what you'll see is folks tailgating on both sides. You'll see folks tailgating in the, the downtown section of Nashville, in the restaurants, in the parking decks, in parking lots. And then what they'll do is it gets closer to game time as they'll go across the, the pedestrian bridge across the river and then they'll go to the stadium. There are lots on stadium side, but it is kind of a, a two-sided animal. So what I would suggest is uh, keep an eye on supporters group ideas and what they're looking for when it comes to, to Nashville and Nashville SC and the, the whole tailgating experience. Because in my times going up there in the past for uh, other football events, it's happened on both sides of the river. Well, yeah, but there's, there's lots. I mean, if you want to yeah, truly tailgate. There's yeah. places to tailgate. Going to restaurants right. and walking across a bridge is not tailgating in my book. No. No, that is it. That is enjoying the game day experience and then wandering over. Oh, <laughs> no, there's a game. You called it tailgating. That's why I was like, wait No, a but minute, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that there are, both, like, there are both lots and the, there are both flat lots and there are uh, parking decks and there are restaurants. So you, it happens on both sides, but not yeah, yeah. to the extent that we would picture. 
there is pregame festivities on both sides. That is a broad enough term that can incorporate everything. Tailgating, I don't know if there's much tailgating happening on the downtown side. I mean, I know there's some lots to park, and then you can go to restaurants, and you can go to a bar, and then you can walk across. Like, if, but if you want to actually tailgate, if you want to set up a grill, if you want to have a cooler of, of beverages, if, if you want to kick a soccer ball around or play some cornhole, there's plenty of places to do it on the stadium side. I don't yes. know if there's as many places to do that on the downtown side. I don't no, think it would be somewhat many. cramped. Now, it would be somewhat cramped if you wanted to do that. You could probably set up a grill and a very small parking lot kind well, of a well, thing. Uh, well, uh, let's, not miss, let's not send people down a road and get them tickets. I, I don't know if that's allowed on the other side. Generally, yeah. that's not allowed everywhere. So yeah. follow your, your supporters groups. I know there's going to be Atlanta United supporters groups doing tailgates in a traditional tailgating sense. Um, right. If you're going up and you're not part of the, the supporters groups, but you're going to get tickets or you just want to get both sides of the experience, there's plenty of bars and restaurants on the downtown side that are close to the stadium that you can go hang out and then walk across. So you've got all the different options. But if you're looking for the specific gulch style tailgating it's going to be mostly on the stadium side of the river, and yeah. and there's wide open lots. It's not like Mercedes Benz where there's not a ton of parking lots around the stadium. This one there there are. I mean, yeah. I tailgated for a couple different U.S. national team games up there years ago on that side, and pretty traditional big stadium with big parking lots around it. So you'll have plenty of room to to truly tailgate if you want to do that. But if you want to do the bar crawl side of it, you can do that as well. Yes. So it, it is uh, both sides available, but stick to the stadium side if you're looking for the traditional tailgating experience. Although yeah, nothing I want to tell people to park in some downtown lot and set up a grill and then have the popo show up and then we've no, we got be bad. people blaming us. You're yeah, going to have to go bail them out, John. No, well, actually, uh, now that you mention that, my AAA is uh, available for $1,000, but I usually reserve that for uh, oh, folks well, AAA's closer. AAA is going to bail somebody out of jail. Well, AAA that's doesn't, let, doesn't cover that. No, there's they give you a card when you're a member of AAA that sits there and says you can this this card is effective for uh, <laughs> bail up to a thousand. Do that bucks. when you're in jail? Don't know. I've, I've <laughs> never I've never experienced it. Nor nor do I want to. But I know that that it does happen. When they give you AAA gives you this card, yes. sits there and says one time only up to a thousand bucks. Does anyone know what's going on here? I don't know, Bruce. All right, let's move on. <laughs> I'm going to call AAA if I ever get arrested and see what happens. You're not going to you're not going to call me and have me exercise my $1000 card? If no, because you're going to try to use AAA to get me out of jail and I'm going to be stuck in jail. Okay. <laughs> going after the the question this morning somewhat. Uh, Ricky Ricardo came in. How would y'all rank your potential 2026 World Cup host sites? Uh, I would not put Atlanta sixth, like one list no. that I saw, because yeah, no. that was just entertaining. Um, yes. Let's see. Let me make sure I got the right list, so I don't want to lead people down the wrong road here. Uh, cities. Let's see. USA Today did this, but is this an old one? Um Uh, okay, so here's what we have as possibilities at this point. Um, a lot of people have said, and this is from USA Today where we are starting from, uh, Baltimore, Nashville, Cincinnati, Houston, Denver, Boston, Orlando as potential cuts. I, Houston, I'm not putting in that category just yet. Uh, Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Francisco, Philadelphia, New York, Miami, Los Angeles, and I believe the Rose Bowl and the new stadium are potentially up for grabs. Uh, Kansas yes, City, Dallas, think, yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Um, I think Atlanta will have a semifinal. I, I'd be shocked if that doesn't happen. I think potentially for the final... The new stadium in L.A. Yep. Uh, I think Dallas qualifies. Uh, MetLife oh, in New Jerry York. 
And I though I think FedEx might qualify as a potential final host, but I don't think they get it. Um I'm leaning New York. I think since they did a final in Los Angeles last time around, doing a final in New York would be pretty big. Pretty big. And I, I know MetLife isn't technically New York, but you know what we're talking about here. Let's not get into yeah. too many semantics this morning. Um, I'll go that right now. And, and I don't know. I, I don't know what the bids are. I don't know what these infrastructures are inside. I don't know, you know, the number of hotels in these cities. I don't have that stuff in front of me. I'm, I'm going by a gut reaction. So if we do that, if we go New York for a final, if we do a semi in Atlanta, if we do another semi in Dallas, let's throw it in Dallas because AT&T Stadium is going to get some big stuff. Yeah. Uh, You're going to have 10, so that's three cities that will have games. Los Angeles will obviously have games at one of those venues, and I think they'll probably go to the new one just for newness sake. Mm -hmm. So that's four. Um, I think Miami will get games. Yep. That's five. I think San Francisco will get games. That's six. Levi's? Yeah, that's the one that's up for the bid. I mean, where else would it go? Don't know, just asking. Yeah, I don't think there's another stadium that's even possible. Uh, Seattle could get one, so that's seven. Yep. Washington, I think, will get one. That's eight. Yep. Um, I like Houston as a possibility as a nine, and I think there'll be a wild card of either Nashville or Orlando. I think they'll get it. I don't know. Philadelphia is a tough one to leave out. Hmm. That last one, two spots are going to be tough. Houston, Philly, Nashville, Orlando, Kansas City are the ones that are going for it. Um, I'll go Houston. Man, I think normally there would be a wild card, but I think Philly's too strong. I think they'll get it. Okay, here's the Joe Prince right list from NBC Sports. And I'll go with missing out first. Cincinnati, Baltimore. Baltimore's so close to Washington. I think it's one or the other, and you're probably going to go with the capital. So, Orlando, he has missing out. Yeah, a lot of people do. Nashville, he has missing out. Yeah. Houston, he has missing out. That's the one that I disagree with. I think they will get in. Philadelphia, he has missing out. That's a tough one. I'm not, not so sure on that one. And then Kansas City is his other missing out. They're right there on the line. What's his 10? Denver and Boston are the two that he would disagree with you on. Boston has had it before. I I just don't know if Foxborough is more appealing than Philadelphia, Houston, Nashville, or Orlando. I just don't think it is because it's not Boston proper. Yeah. And it was one thing when you were doing this in 94, but now you have more options. Ah, I think Philly would get it before Foxborough would. If you're looking in that part of the country, and I know they're not really that close, but when you're looking at 10 sites across the country, you're going to get a little limited and you want to spread it around. I just don't know if Foxborough gets it. I think there's too many better options and newer options, too. Yeah, because you look at Philadelphia, you play at the Link. Houston, you play at NRG. Nashville, you play at Nissan. So Nashville's those... going to have to make a really compelling case. And, right. and if they come out and, and really turn some heads with attendance this year, and look, there's questions about that, it could ride on that. Because Nissan's not a brand new stadium either. No. You know, that would be a big market and a big new market. But if you have Atlanta, they might say, well, we'd rather go there. And if they look at maybe Cincinnati and say, well, I like Cincinnati better than Nashville. So I, I think Cincinnati and Nashville both lose out narrowly. Yep. I, I think it's going to be tough. 
I Foxborough, I just think is going to be the one that maybe gets squeezed out. Because now, I, mean, I don't know look- if Miami and Orlando get it. That's another, yeah. you know, consideration True. here is I don't know if both get it. Um, and if one gets it, I would probably think Miami does. Right. You know, you, you look at New York, New Jersey, no brainer, uh, cronky world. Yes. You know, they're saying well, it's either, I mean, well, either the Rose bowl or cronky world, but LA figure- will get it. And I don't know which venue they go with. I don't know if they go history with Rose bowl or if they go with the other one. I don't think both will get games. Yeah. Unless they decide to do a scenario where, you know, okay, Los Angeles gets it and the Rose Bowl gets two games and the new stadium gets two games or something. Yeah. DC, yes, FedEx, right. I just think Miami. it's DC or Baltimore. And I don't know yeah, if, if it DC. becomes DC, Baltimore, or Philadelphia. And that would yeah. be a question for the, the bid committee, but. I think it's hard from a FIFA standpoint to look at this from the outside and say, well, we're going to pick cities other than the nation's capital. Yeah. And, he, you know, with Miami, I understand it. His ranking of Atlanta at six, to me, it was a head scratcher. It but, just felt like pulling out a list from like 1994 or the 2010 bid and then saying, oh, yeah, Atlanta's done really well since then, so well, they'll get into six. I mean, he's saying Atlanta will get it. Atlanta's yeah. going to get World Cup games. That's a that's an absolute no brainer. The question is, how high do they go up? So, right, just ranking them is one thing, but I think you have to start ranking them by games and what games they get. And the final Atlanta Mercedes Benz Stadium, it's not quite big enough. It has to be over eighty thousand, so that limits the number of potential venues. And I think you're probably looking at three really significant options here, L.A., Dallas, or New York. And since they've done a final in L.A., I think they have an opportunity to do it elsewhere. And I think New York would be the one that would get it. I think FIFA would really get excited about having a World Cup final in New York. Yeah. Capacity for MetLife is listed at 82,550. Yeah, it's big enough. So it's it's just under that that just over the 80,000 marker Rose bowl. We know is six figures and I'm going to look up, do we know what the capacity for Inglewood is supposed to be? Is it supposed to be it's in that neighborhood? Thousand, I thought. So it's going to be big enough. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be big enough. Yeah. Uh, okay. Listed at 70,240. Uh, I thought it was going to be bigger than that. I thought it was too. Okay, well, then the Rose Bowl is the only option, and I don't think they get a second final. But, yeah, so I'm right there with you in all this. Construction cost just under $5 billion. Ah, okay, here we go. Capacity is 70240 expandable to 100240 for Super Bowls, That's WrestleMania, FIFA World Cup, right. Summer Olympics. Okay, so there you go. But, yeah, uh, I Boston, for me, seems like it's odd man out. And... Denver, Joe Prince Wright has that as his 10th city, but, you know, I'm like, mm, yeah, I understand I the geography it of the it. I would do for the altitude. I wouldn't yeah. do it because it's going to be so different than the rest of the, the cities. I, I wouldn't yeah. go there, and, and it's not a knock on Denver. Denver's a great city, and I think in a, you know, all U.S. World Cup, it's possible that they would get games, but when you're only limited to 10... I just don't think Denver gets it. I, I think yeah. Philly is more compelling. I think Houston is far more compelling. And you have the potential with that stadium to close the roof, correct? At NRG, yeah. Yeah. So in you know, in the summer? Four billion bad. degrees. Yeah, not bad. And I think that's gonna be something that puts it over the top. And we are done with yesterday's stuff, so we are officially caught up with that. We have folks who have commented on your question for the morning. Yeah, John Nason said, I think you need a geographical spread. And I've got, yeah, they are coast heavy. And I've got Dallas in there. I've got Houston in there. You know, those are the ones that, you know, the problem is we're not just going from scratch here. You know, you've only got certain cities that are up there. The only other cities in the middle that factor in would be Denver, and Kansas City. 
And I don't know if you're going to get three of those four with Dallas, Houston, Denver, Kansas City. You know, I mean, out of those, Dallas, I think, is a no-brainer. Yeah. I think Houston is next out of that ranking for me. Some people would say Denver. I'd, I'd go Houston, even though it's two in Texas. You know, does Kansas City maybe benefit from that? If John is correct and they want to go more of a spread and you look at Dallas or Houston, you're going to go Dallas. You look yes. at Denver in the mix and you add altitude to it. Kansas City might benefit from that and, and get a spot in the middle because you want that spread. I can buy that. I can buy that. I, I think I'd rather see it in Houston, but if that's the determination, you want more of a spread, you don't want to in Texas, and I just don't think there's a point to bringing altitude into it and, and right. complicating the competition. So yeah. if Kansas City becomes a compromise spot, okay, if they get it over Houston, I can buy it. I, I'd rather go Houston, but that's a that's a valid point, John Nason. Um, beyond that, I mean, it is coast-heavy. Because that's the the ones that have bid. Chicago stayed out of it, so that would have been one that would have been a no brainer. Um, it is what it is, based off the cities that have bid. And Arrowhead's capacity for football is listed at seventy nine four fifty one. So final. it's in it doesn't the, matter. It's getting games. The, we're not yeah, we're not putting it in that ranking. Just getting games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, John continues with a question that we don't know any answers to yet. Uh, pod scheduling, group the cities together. I don't know how they're going to do it. I have no idea. Um, they didn't do that in 94, and there were people that were not happy about it. You had some travel that was kind of bizarre. If I remember right, Argentina played their first two games in Foxborough and then played at the Cotton Bowl and then played their knockout round game in L.A. It's kind of weird. I mean, and remember, this is going to be a different format, too. This is the 48-team tournament where you've got a bunch of three-team groups, and you're not playing as many group games, and it's all over the place. I don't know how they're going to do it, and I'm a little surprised that it's been so slow in these developments. I mean, it's been very recently that we got an update that Dan Flynn's going to be overseeing this. At one point, I think the thought was Sunil Gulati would be doing that. Uh, Dan Flynn, who's the former CEO of U.S. Soccer, who most people thought was going to go and be the president of the St. Louis MLS team. Now he's going to be overseeing the World Cup. But you don't have any real process yet to determine the U.S. cities. And, I mean, it feels like, okay, you look at it, 2020, 2026, oh, you got plenty of time. No. You don't really. When you start getting to that next level of, okay, who are the cities going to be? What's the format going to look like? Now you've got to block hotel rooms. Now you've got to block other things. You've got to determine the uh, TV facility and, and who's going to handle that. The World Broadcast Center, Atlanta's up for that as well. There's a lot to do. That's not even getting into sponsorship. That's not even getting into you know nuts and bolts logistics. So there's a ton to do. I'm surprised that it's just dragged on this long after they won the bid. And it was a huge focal point of Carlos Cordero's first few months in office and a big part of Sunil Gulati's last couple of years in office. Okay, once you got it, it felt like everybody just said, okay, cool, we're good for a while. We'll be back in a couple of years. And we'll see. Yeah, you can't do that. Well, you can because you did. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's done. Now you got to play catch up a little bit. You've got time to make up the ground, but you need to start making some progress and answering some questions like this. You know, I mean, you know what the format is. So when you start picking these cities, how are you going to do it in terms of this? Or are you going to have a team with two group games that's going to decide where they go? Are they going to play one in the East Coast and one in the West Coast? Are they going to play one in Mexico and then one in Miami? I mean, do we have any sense of what that's going to look like? If we do, it's not really public. So we'll have to wait and see. But 
It's going to be an interesting process. I think Atlanta is fine. I don't expect any surprises in terms of Atlanta not getting World Cup games in 2026. I think they are pretty much guaranteed at least a quarterfinal. I think Atlanta gets a semifinal, but that's going to be pretty competitive because the final is going to be down to, I think, those three markets. I think L.A., New York, Dallas, and I think New York gets it. I don't think D.C. will be a legitimate option there. When you compare FedEx to AT&T in Dallas, the the brand-new stadium in L.A. or MetLife, I don't think FedEx holds up. I just I, I don't think you can put a World Cup final there when you have the other options that you do. So once you get there and start working backwards, then you get whoever doesn't get the final. All right, they get competitive to get semifinals. Then you get the cities that have stadiums that aren't quite big enough for the final that get into that conversation. And Atlanta will be one of those. But it won't be easy to get a semi. I think they get a quarterfinal, no questions asked. Yeah, Tafka admits he tuned out for a minute, but he wondered if uh, MBS is a likely semifinals location. Would it also host group stage? Surely, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not just going to host a semifinal. You're going to get you know four to six games, something like that. So, yeah, that's that's not how it works. Like you don't have stadiums just pop up and get a semi. Ryan Lee says Mexico City has a higher elevation than Denver. Would you exclude Mexico City? No, but and you can't. And, and that's another knock against Denver for me is like you can't exclude Mexico City. You can't exclude the Azteca. So do you want two altitude stadiums coming into the mix? I wouldn't. That's just me. Um, I could be completely wrong in it, but. I wouldn't want that if I can help it. And again, I think with the competition for for spots here, you have better options to avoid that. So I would avoid it in the U.S., but Mexico City, no, you can't. You just you have to play there, and you know that going in. Yep. All right, everybody's caught up on the 2026 stuff. You want to get into this morning's question? Uh, sure. So the idea here is our Friday flashback. Looking back at 94, you know, what are the most impactful things in terms of the growth of American soccer since the 94 World Cup? It can be people, it can be things, it can be leagues, it can be teams, it can be competitions, it can be whatever. Um, Coach Eistray chimed in. He's got a couple different things. Increased diversity within the country has tremendously helped grow the youth game, which eventually turned over a new generation of lovers of the game. That's a definite. Uh, I've seen that here in the Atlanta area. I've seen that in a lot of cities where Gwen's fired up too. She is ready say, for Gwen agrees uh, with the Trey. World Cup as well. So you've seen a lot of increased diversity around the country. And a lot of that increased diversity has brought a lot of new potential fans and supporters of the game into markets that maybe didn't have that before. Atlanta's a completely different place since 94. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's go back to 94 and when they were determining the cities for that one, Atlanta's option was Grant Field. That was it. Uh, Fulton County Stadium was up in the air at that point. You had the Braves play in there anyway, so it wasn't likely. Uh, that's why Miami didn't get games in that World Cup, because the Marlins were playing at what's now Hard Rock, what was then, I think, Joe Robbie. Um, baseball was a, a huge factor in that, but Grant Field wasn't going to get games at that point. And I've talked to Dick Cecil about this. Uh, Dick Cecil was the uh, organizer of the Atlanta Chiefs. He was heavily involved in a lot of this type of conversation about the 94 World Cup. And he hosted the the bid committee when they came, including members of FIFA. And, you know, they come and, and take a look at, at Grant Field. And this was 1990, I think. And they had the artificial turf that they were going to put grass over. But it had the big crown on it, too. And it just did not look like a soccer stadium. Now, we saw it look like one later on. 
but in 1990, maybe not, and, and especially not for a World Cup. So Atlanta didn't really have an opportunity for that, let alone it was already a long shot because Atlanta didn't have a, a thriving international community at that point. It didn't have a thriving soccer community at that point. It was a little bit smaller. So Atlanta's changed a lot in this time span. There's plenty of other cities that have too. And then he also mentions introduction of the European game via TV and the internet. And yeah, I mean, games are more common. Level too. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll games get there in a second. Common. Games are more common. You can watch games all the time. Gwen's watching a game in the living room and barking her head off at the referee. Y- you can watch games from all over the world. It's not even just the European game. I mean, in, in 94 trying to think of what was available on TV in, in a normal sense. Now, you had satellites. You had some pubs that were doing the closed circuit games that you could go watch. Uh, but 1994, you get your U.S. national team games on ABC or ESPN. You would get... May, I don't, you weren't even getting the Fox like Premier League recap show. That was a little bit later. Uh, you were getting Liga MX on Univision at that time. And you'd get some other games on Univision. But in English, it was pretty much national team, random college games. That's about it. I don't know if Soccer Made in Germany was still going at that point. I don't think it was. That was never something really so. in my orbit. So I I couldn't tell you. It was very limited, and now, I mean, even beyond the streaming side of it, like, it's games all the time, and and that's been a huge factor. I know for me, I can speak for myself in this one, you know, growing up as a fan and, and loving the game and playing and, and all of that, I think I was probably my best as a player in 96, 97, because that was when you had MLS start and you had those games on TV a pretty good bit. And I was hardcore enough that there were bars, you know, both in the Atlanta area and in, in Athens that had satellite dishes. And this was when you could pull up, you know, a, a game, you could say, Hey, it's on this channel on satellite. You know, here's the coordinates. <laughs> Can you, you mm-hmm. throw it on? And they would. So if there was nothing else going on, if there was a random baseball game from Seattle, then maybe not. But anyway, um, I just watched a lot of games. There were more games to watch. It was it was more accessible. And you watch games and you pick things up and you see things and you start to do them when you play subconsciously because it's just there. That was critical for me. And I wish I'd had it when I was younger and it could have had more of an impact. But kids now, like, Watching a game, second nature. Um, all of that factors into to what Trey said about improved coaching at the grassroots level. Goes back to just awareness, knowledge, the increased diversity factors in too. But all of it, you just have, you know, not just the players who are watching these games and learning, but you have coaches that are watching these games and learning. Now you have, you know, people my age who really developed their love of the game during this time frame and now they're coaching so they're not starting from scratch like coaches were at this time or before they've got a bigger base of knowledge so that's been a huge factor because it's gotten better every year and coaching education from u.s soccer has gotten better every year you just have more options to learn now it's a huge factor. Uh, Trey chimed in with more. The patient growth of MLS didn't allow the game to die at the highest level in this country. It was so different. I mean, I didn't go through the NASL rise and fall. You know, By the time I, I fell in love with soccer, it had been three years since the Chiefs were gone. And I know it had been five years since the Chiefs were gone. It had been two years since the NASL folded. Uh, indoor was a different animal altogether, and we just had the attack for two years. Uh, you had low-level stuff that if if you you know weren't directly connected to it, you might not know about it, and I, I didn't. 
I didn't know about USISL teams that were playing in Gwinnett and just had no way to know that. It wasn't really common knowledge. Uh, you had the A-League or the APSL, and you had the equivalent on the West Coast when they started late 80s, early 90s. But, I mean, you'd get a schedule that would drop and a team would fold. You would get game times that would change. You'd be playing in high school stadiums. It didn't feel big. MLS felt big. Day one, first game, it felt big. That first game at Spartan Stadium in San Jose felt like something I had never seen for professional soccer in the U.S. And by that point, you know, you'd seen games from from different parts of the world, but it felt like our version of that, whereas other leagues didn't feel like that. And I know there's a lot of people, and, and I'm right there too in a lot of things, that like it smaller, that like things more grassroots. I get it. But having something big like MLS even when it wasn't nearly as big as it is now, but it was still bigger than what we'd had before, that is going to be more compelling to a new fan, to a kid, than maybe the local grassroots side. When you have both, you're, you have the best of both worlds, and that's what, what you'd obviously love to have. But if you're trying to attract somebody new to the game, you're going to do it with something big. And MLS has had a huge factor in that. Uh, I, I totally agree with Trey on this one, and I'll, I'll go twofold on it. He says the 2002 World Cup success was huge. I think it was. I think the 2010 Landon Donovan goal was huge as well. Yeah. Um, the success in 2002 overall was one. I think that maybe galvanized the soccer community. That 2010 Landon Donovan goal crossed over into mainstream, and it was just a moment, and sometimes moments are easier to – crossover like that but that was a massive deal so those things combined the national team success and men's and women too because you you, you cross it over the 96 olympics the women winning the 99 world cup for the women those were watershed moments mm -hmm. and they pushed everything forward and I, I i think you know honestly without getting into individual things trey's right it's time just time because all of these things outside of the Donovan goal, all of them are gradual, you know, increased diversity, gradual, improved coaching. That's a gradual thing. It doesn't happen overnight. More games on TV. It's gradual. MLS being patient with its growth, gradual. All those things build up over time and get you to where you are now, where you can turn on your, you know, even if it's a, a small cable package and probably find a game on. And if you have any kind of streaming service, you can probably find multiple games on it pretty much any time of the day. Mm -hmm. And those sorts of developments are, are huge. And the rest of it, it just takes time to continue to build on itself when kids find the game and they develop and then they have kids and then their kids have kids that third generation has more of a knowledge more of an affinity more of a passion for the sport because they've went through two generations that built it and it just continues to build on itself and that's where we're at with american soccer right now chris ashley says it's got to be the advent of uh, at mls right that's led to the growth of the game in this country and has trickled down to the establishment and rise of other leagues. USL, NWSL, USL League One, NISA, NPSL, UPSL, USL League Two, WPSL. The vastness of the country is covered in soccer. Yeah, I think it's twofold. I mean, you know, MLS is a huge part of it. It's not the only part because other things have happened in addition to it. You know, let's let's leave the pro women's leagues to the side for a second because they've had some issues of their own making and just some bad luck as well in terms of timing. Let's look at USL and how it's grown. So the A League was bidding along with MLS to be the Division One league that started after the World Cup. MLS was brand new. The A League had seven or eight teams at that time. 
and were not playing in glamorous venues, had a few games on like Prime Network or Sports Channel America. I believe, and, and this is something I, I definitely want to dig back into over time as I do more history articles and, and stuff. I believe that the idea was it would have been harder to elevate an existing league that was at a smaller level to be this big deal that it needed to be than to start fresh. So they started fresh with MLS. The A-League kind of puttered into 1995, 96, and we've talked about it with the Atlanta Ruckus nearly folding before they played a game. The 95 schedule came out with a Toronto team on it that folded before they played the season. Uh, You had all kinds of just drama and nonsense because it wasn't ready to be as big as it wanted to be. You also had the U.S. ISL growing at that time, which was coming at it from a very grassroots perspective and growing upward. The A-League and U.S. ISL merged in 96 and started their first season together in 97. Now, they didn't get everything right at the beginning. You had a bunch of teams fold. You had a bunch of U.S. ISL teams that weren't strong enough to go up a level. So you had some teams that, that hit the you know, hit the bricks on it. They just could not keep up with where it was. And US, USISL turning into USL, they had issues in the 2000s. That's what started the NASL again because owners didn't want to deal with teams coming and going. They wanted higher standards. They wanted everything to be bigger and more structured. Well, what's funny is they, they did that. They broke away, and they tried to create a league at a higher level. They got the second division sanction. USL had to drop down, and it was USL who actually stabilized through that. And the NASL teams couldn't be at the level they tried to be, and they ended up going away. And USL benefited from taking that step back. It took them a while, but... All of that has led to where USL is now with the championship, with League One, with League Two, with an Academy Cup and League that is starting, and and all the different elements of USL that are very important in the growth of soccer in the U.S. Critical, because MLS can't be in every market. And it's great that it's on TV, and it's great that a a kid in Greenville can watch Atlanta United on, on Fox Sports South, but also watch games on ESPN and Unimas. But now they have a team locally that they can go watch. And that's huge. That's huge because it's one thing to have the TV presence, but where you have the local presence, even more impactful. So MLS's growth has been a big part of it, but USL making the decisions that they did after a lot of bumps in the road. They found the right way, and and now their growth is a, a huge element. And the other leagues, I mean, you know, NISA, I think there's still a lot to be determined about that. They It feels a lot like the early days of USL figuring it out as they go, and I hope that they do. Right now, it's kind of all over the place. NPSL, UPSL, your local regional leagues – that's a grassroots element that's very important too. And it's a breeding ground and you're going to see teams start there and move up the ladder. I hope that those leagues realize what their strong suits are. And I think NPSL has, you know, you'd heard all the rumors along the way about NPSL doing a pro league and, and flirting with that. Their strength is in the regional grassroots. That's where they're really good. And they open up some opportunities for clubs to grow, starting from a smaller position than than USL League 2 does. Technically, they're they're kind of the same thing in terms of level in the U.S. soccer pyramid. But NPSL and and UPSL, even more localized, can can offer those opportunities that USL can't. And clubs will start there and, and grow and potentially grow into a pro club or or a USL League 2 team. Whatever, it works, that's good. The, the clubs are the important thing here. But all of these different leagues have helped it. And it's not all down to MLS. MLS has been part of that. But you know, people learning along the way and, and finding what's worked. Even the failures have had a hand in growing this. 
and hopefully now you're past most of the failures. NISA is in a position where they can try some things and they can find their own path. Because is there a pathway between USL League One and the Summer League teams or the year-round amateur teams? Yeah, I think there is. I, I think there can be something in that realm. I don't know if both are D3. I don't know if one's D3 and one's D4. I, I don't know. I don't know that level yet. Nisa doesn't know what it is yet. It needs time to figure that out. And I hope that they do. And I hope they don't bite off too much so that they can chew. And, and that's always been the concern when you start with a small number of teams that are spread over the country. You're asking those teams to do a lot where... It's better to grow like USL eventually did regionally and what NPSL and UPSL have done and grow regionally because you can grow at a maybe more sustainable pace than dropping in and flying across the country for a match. When I've I've said this many times, I don't think Chattanooga playing Oakland is more compelling than Chattanooga playing Knoxville. I don't think it is. Or Chattanooga playing Charleston or Chattanooga playing Charlotte. I think the local element is more compelling and I think it makes more sense from a business perspective. And I hope NISA and ISA, I don't I don't know if we're going to officially go with NISA is what we're going to call them, but I hope we get to a point that they can bridge those gaps and not have quite as much crazy travel. Cause I don't think it's good for the clubs in the long run. You're asking these clubs out of the blocks that are wanting to be a part of something like NISA to do a lot of heavy lifting. And there's uh, a lot of trust, I guess, from those front offices that yes, they're a part of something, but what you're asking these guys to sit there and be your flag bearers, but they're having to do it with a lot of investment across the country i mean yeah the the chattanooga oakland thing i mean you're sitting there going that's uh and to do that multiple times to go from chattanooga to philly or wherever you're really putting a lot of investment into something and you're at the front of the line of this so there's there's got to be a lot of faith in what you're doing for these franchises and you hope that over time there's going to be that regionalism, that, that regionalistic approach for these leagues for it to continue uh, to, to grow and be a success. But yeah, out of the blocks for something like this, you're really asking a lot of your flagship teams in these new leagues to do something like this where you're having to hopscotch and sit there and present your brand to everyone and say that, yes, we're doing this and yes, uh, you need to – you should be a part of this if you're interested in doing this going forward. So now there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a lot of investment, and uh, I really think that the regionalistic aspect of it for me is far more important when you're trying to grow something. Although you know I understand a league wanting to do something like this from the jump, I, I do understand it. But I think how that, many leagues that do this from the jump do it well though? That's, that's the, the thing. problem. Yeah is it's hard it's hard to do yeah. this from the jump because you're not talking about multimillionaires funding this and willing to take mm. a loss for an extended period of time you're you're talking about you know clubs that have grown from the grassroots that are having to you know their their budget has to just dramatically blow up overnight and yeah. that's difficult and, and let alone budget i mean just logistics just all of it you think it's easy to to book flights and book hotels and and coordinate travel and all those things. It's not. You've it's done difficult. it. Yeah, no, I've done it at I've done it driving. I've done it at, at small levels. I'm talking when you're getting into a nationwide league. Like you're past my skill set. You're past a, a lot of people's skill sets because these people are doing multiple things because it's small clubs. I think a lot of it is knowing where you fit in the in the ladder i don't i'm I, i'm scared i don't want no one if i want to call it a pyramid that seems to trigger people Let, let's call it a ladder you need to know where you fit and where you best fit and i think usl ended up finding that over time after not really knowing for a while uh a league never truly did until they merged which they needed to with usl nasl 
I honestly think they knew where they fit at first, and then they decided to try to be something different when the Cosmos came in, and they wanted to be alongside MLS rather than be just underneath it. And that's what ultimately was a big problem for them. USL accepted being underneath it and finding all the space underneath it to grow. I think there's space to grow underneath USL Championship and USL League One, but I don't think that's what NISA is looking at. I think they're looking at growing past that. And if they are, that's fine, but I think starting there is going to be hard. Yes. And we'll see, because... It's a huge commitment to start something like this from scratch without much promise of immediate revenues to make it work. So you've got to have money to burn to grow it. Yeah. And we'll find out if these owners do. You've already had two clubs that have fizzled. Atlanta's one of them. I mean, their website's not active anymore, so I'm assuming they're they're done. They're not in the, the Open Cup. There's been talk about potentially them coming back in the fall, but they're going to have to get their website back up on online and, and maybe tweet since November. Yes. And Philadelphia was in the, the league and on the schedule and didn't go to a game because of uh, storms and then disappeared. And there's talk about them coming back, but that's two already. Now you've got more teams coming in here in the spring, and then I think Cosmos are coming in in the fall. That's great. And if you can weather these early bumps, cool. But I, I just... I worry that they're trying to do too much too fast and yes. we'll see where it goes. Um, and that's not from, they shouldn't be at that point. If they can grow into a league that is that big, that grow into the league that's that big. I think it's the fact that when you start too much, too, too big, too fast, when you try to do more than you're capable of too early, you do more damage that way instead of taking a more patient, slower exactly. approach. We'll yes. see. Katie Weaver, the proliferation, and that's a big word on a Friday, the proliferation of global soccer on TV has helped. Watching soccer isn't just for us nerds with Fox Soccer Channel or Gold TV. Kids can watch EPL Saturday mornings on Big NBC. Game New Heroes watching the Euros on ESPN. Soccer is just far less niche than it was 20 years ago. It's just more available, and that's been the the number one thing for me, and People who will try to tell you that they know everything about the game, don't listen to them. Because the the ones that have said that, that implies that they don't need to keep learning. And that's not the case. You know, I, I learn pretty much every time I put a game on something new, whether it's about culture, whether it's about a team, history, tactics, uh, styles, all of it. Because this game is so global. And in the United States, we're finding that you're getting all of those different elements coming into the American game. And, you know, you need to know how Pitti Martinez's league history was in Argentina to understand Pitti Martinez in Atlanta. You need to understand what Emerson Hyndman went through on his loans and his time in, in England and Scotland before coming to Atlanta as to why he is the player that he is managers and their backgrounds. You have to know this stuff and you have to constantly be looking at the new developments because if you stop, if you settle, if you say, I know all of it and I don't need to evolve anymore in whatever role you are in the game, you miss out because just in the last few years, you've seen Jurgen Klopp bring different things to the table than we've really seen in the game in the in previous decades. Pep Guardiola has had to continually evolve and find new ways, and now he's being challenged in ways that he's never been. You have Antonio Conte bringing different elements in, drawing from the past, but finding ways to make it fit in the modern game you have to continually keep up with this because it's always growing and evolving and just having it more accessible and more available makes the game stronger here because we're not as tied into in Argentina. You have the Argentine way you have the, uh, you know, the way that they play the history that they have, and that can weigh pretty heavy on evolution. You have that in other countries as well. Here, you don't have as much of that. 
here new elements can come into the mix and, and have an effect pretty quick because there's not as much immediate pushback. I think it's only now that we're starting to get, you know, whether it's in coaching, education, different elements of, no, this is how we do it. And now you're starting to get a little bit of that, but still it's, it's more of a clean slate in the U S. So all of these leagues and, and games and, and stories just being more widely available grow the game in a massive way. For me, I didn't know if this was a chicken or egg element to this question, but for me, the answer was a combination of the stability and growth of MLS, which created the 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 interest in other leagues and other divisions and other cities and the regionalism of it and working its way through the the landscape that way, plus the advent of the 500 channel universe, where you can look and see games and you can go to uh, Tiudene or you can go to Univision or you can go on your streaming service or you can find it on networks and things like that. And I didn't know for, for me, I didn't know if it was one or the other one creating the other, but I just, I viewed both of them equally as my answer to your question. It was the, the stability that we've seen with MLS creating uh, other folks sitting there saying, yeah, we can do that too, but we can do it here. Plus the accessibility that we have in catching games, not just here in the United States, but on a worldwide basis now. I don't think the stability of MLS affected the worldwide nature of games being available in the U.S. I, I don't think it did. I think it would have happened anyway. I think they've grown side by side. And it's benefited. I think MLS has benefited from games being more accessible in general. And I think the TV broadcasters and and media outlets have the potential to benefit more from the growth of MLS. But some of them have to see that that's a, a viable way. We'll see. There, there's plenty more to get into, uh, more tweets. We'll do that in hour number two. We'll also get into some news and rumors around MLS, USL Championship, and more. Some NWSL big trades yesterday. We'll get into all of that in hour number two. Be right back. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Soccer down here. January 17th, hour number two. 
We'll get back into the Friday flashback as we go in hour number two. Tweet at us your thoughts on some of the most impactful things in the growth of American soccer since the 94 World Cup. Uh, Let's move on to some current news. Atlanta United players have spoken to the media this morning. One of them, and a lot of people had this one circled down, is Julian Gressel. Here's his quote from Doug Robertson's article over at the AJC. Obviously, I have kind of a feeling of what you guys want to ask. I think I'm in a position where at the moment I don't want to speak about my current contract situation. I've said something a lot in the past, and that stands. That's valid. I have nothing to really add at that moment. That's the truth. Obviously, I want a resolution to this as soon as possible, but that's for my agent and the club to work out. I don't want this to be hanging over our heads in preseason. I don't think that's fair to our club and to our team, and especially not fair to our teammates, where I don't want them to get dragged into this. We want to get ready and prepare for a fast approaching and difficult start to the season. That's where I stand and what I think. It's something I hope you can respect. I'm sorry that there's not more info at the moment. That's just it. Thoughts? There you go. He's put it out there, and... You know, I, I I wonder how many more folks are going to continue to ask about it. Uh, we just said he didn't want to talk about it, so I'd hope that they don't. But no, but you know that people are going to continue to to poke and prod and press about it. But all right, so he's uh, he's made his statement, and all right, so now it's left up to agents and folks to sit there and, and start to. Uh, to continue negotiating about it. So I'm just, I'm treating it as it is. I'm looking at it at face value. And it's like, all right, so that's your statement. And uh, we'll, I'll keep going forward. When asked if, if he would, would have said what he said, even if there appeared to be a pending resolution to the negotiations, he said, probably, yeah. I didn't want to go back into what we had at the end of last season where it was questions, answers, questions, answers. I just felt like at this point I've said my stuff and want the club and my agent to figure it out and move forward. And that's it. So yeah. that that's where it stands. Um, we will see, you know, how this continues. I, you know, I, it sounds like he's leaving it to the agent and the club to figure out. And Darren Eels has said on 92.9 The Game that once there's a CBA and they have resolution there, then they'll sit down and figure it out. And, you know, you could take Darren's comments to say that they value Julian Gressel and they want him to be part of this club for a a long period of time. And that's kind of how I took it was, you know, once they have the direction on the CBA, then they can move forward on this. They just can't until then. And I'm hopeful that, you know, that's understood now. And it sounds like from these comments that it is, it's just, you know, it, it is what it is right now. And I think, you know, Julian mentioned it a couple of times in, in the comments this morning about not wanting his teammates to be dragged into it. And, you know, that was something that was a, a little unfair. And I've seen some people try to twist comments that were made, uh, Joseph Martinez specifically, into something more that it wasn't. I, I was right. standing right there when that happened. It, it was said with a laugh and an obvious... Uh, you know, playing a character, playing a role, having some fun with it, because there's nothing that other players can say about it. They don't have any influence over club signings. They don't have anything to do with that. And, you know, Joseph said it. He's like, that's what the front office does. I have opinions, but it's not my place to actually do anything about it because I can't. I'm a player. It's what it is. So... Hopefully, we'll we'll see where this goes. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get into, I think, more important things right now, because... You know, he is under contract for 2020. He's Mm -hmm. got a big opportunity to position himself for the contract that he wants. And, you know, if he goes out and and doesn't have a good season, that's not going to help, depending on when this gets done. It's all about focusing now on what's to come in 2020. And, And Gressel's been a big part of this team. So... I think the hope is for this team to continue to grow, that he'll be an even bigger part of it. Yes. But, and, you know, the performance has to be there. And when there's distractions, mm-hmm. it's hard to perform at the top level. Right. And uh, getting back to your point briefly about uh, this, the CBA and kind of trying to 
when you have a better footing, Steve Hummer caught up with Darren Eels and asked him about uh, Julian's situation. And that was what Darren pretty much had said as well. It's like, you know, we, when we figure out what the CBA says, then we'll have a better idea. And you know, right now, everyone just wants to focus on what's going on on the field because Atlanta United has goals and aspirations. They want to continue to keep adding to the trophy case. They want to keep adding championships. They want to be at the top of the ladder. They want to keep being that successful brand and that successful team that they've been over these last couple of years and continue to grow in that. And right now, everybody is in training camp and they got work to do. And that's what uh, that's what they want to focus on right now. That's what you have to focus on. I mean, that that's what is important at the moment because if you get distracted right now, and, and I thought Frank DeBoer really nailed it on Monday, this is the time where you get strong. This is the time where you get ready to compete at a high level like CONCACAF, like MLS. This is where you build everything that will help you succeed in the season. Because this is the only time in the year that you're going to get this much time to train. And these preseason games, for the most part, are extensions of training. It's not like a regular season match. It's not like a CONCACAF match or an Open Cup match. These preseason games are extensions of training. So don't get caught up in results. It doesn't matter. It's all about taking advantage of this long period of time to build the foundation of who you are in 2020. So all the different tactical possibilities, all the different you know, combinations, all the different ways that this team can look, you've got to build that now because it's much harder to do it on the fly. It can be done. We've seen it. It's not ideal, and it's risky. If you're able to build those foundational elements now, you're going to have a stronger season. Distractions can get in the way of that. Yep. And it's about focusing now and getting ready and moving forward. Yes. And that's and you've got uh you've got your exhibition schedule set in front of you. You know what your goals are to you know what markers you want to work on and you get to figure that out on a daily basis as you're getting ready for uh, a very important season. Not that the previous ones haven't been any less important, but this one's the next one right there uh, in line and you know what you want to accomplish and that's what you're you're out there to do in this particular time frame you want to get everything squared away you want to get your 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 player relationships and get everybody's uh those the societies that we talk about you want to get that figured out and with what frank DeBoer and the staff want to do in year two you've got that extra little bit of time that you didn't have last year to figure out what frank wants to have out there on the pitch with uh, the new guys who were there with the pieces that you've lost and how everything integrates together the other seasons mean nothing at this point. It's clean slate. You just got to move forward. Um, you hope you can bring elements of other seasons forward, but they count for nothing when the games start. Uh, Pitti Martinez talked about that a little bit. Uh, Doug Robertson doesn't have the direct quote. It's I'm sure it's translated. Uh, Pitti Martinez said he hopes to play this season like he ended last season, wants to make it to the national team, also wants to eventually play for a club in Europe once his time with Atlanta United is done. All, you know, the the same things that we've heard all along. You know, Pitti was called into the national team last year, picked up an injury, wasn't called back. You have a Copa America this summer. You have a Copa America that half of it will be played in Argentina this summer. That is a once-in-a-lifetime kind of opportunity for an Argentine player. So I think you're going to see a very motivated Pitti Martinez early in the season to try to turn some heads in the Argentine camp. He also talked about the rumors of Gremio's interest online, and he said they, those things pop up all the time on social media. His head's in Atlanta. There hasn't been anything credible on any of that. That's social media talk that happens all the time. Yeah, and I think that that's something that uh, Atlanta United fans uh, just need to get used to. You're going to have your players wanted on a, a worldwide basis, and you're no, going that's, to that's see a different. No, that's a different conversation. It's not about being wanted. These are made up rumors. That's a whole other thing. Um, there's no credible sources that are saying that Grimio made an offer and wanted Pity Pity Martinez. That's a different conversation. Players are going to be wanted, and there's going to be offers made, and things are going to happen. Leandro Gonzalez-Pierre is prime example. 
don't think that was the plan at the end of last season, but it became something that you did because it made sense. Pitti Martinez being linked to Gremio on social media is nothing. <laughs> There's just nothing there. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just rumor. And you're going to see this stuff, whether the, whether it's whether there's credible information behind it or it's just stuff that folks with 15 or 20 followers are going to put up on a wall. You're going to see this stuff when you have players, the quality of a PT Martinez, of an Ezekiel Barco, you know, even of a Joseph Martinez. You're going to see people sitting there and throwing stuff up against a wall and whether credible or not, it's just a, a part of the day to day now. You got to know the differences, though, and that's what yes. I, I beg the the fan base to seek out the the right people who are out there telling you about this that are they're giving you true information and not just sharing random tweets. You know, I mean, now sometimes, yeah, we've seen a random tweet turn into something, but how many random tweets have you seen be nothing? The overwhelming majority of them. Mm -hmm. So. Just have to know that that's all part of the process, whether it's a random tweet, whether it's a supporter of a club. He says, yeah, I want Pitti Martinez, and it starts to get traction. When it's a credible journalist, and when it is a credible outlet, and when it's a move that actually makes sense. And there's some that just have not made any sense, and there's some that have. So... You just have to, to try to take all of that with a grain of salt as best you can and, and dig into it before you, you fall into the trap of, of living and dying with, with tweets. Yeah, and that's, like I said, that, and that's just, I guess, part of the, the learning experience. It's of, part of life these days. Yeah, and, and being attached to a particular franchise when you have levels of success when you have overall success consistent success and you continue to bring in players who are wanted so just uh, it's uh it's a part of the deal and just understand what you're what you're going to be seeing when it comes to social media is that there may be stuff that's credible there's going to be a lot of stuff that isn't so just uh, shop wisely don't, don't even shop wisely read wisely and that's that not if nothing to do with Atlanta United or soccer as a whole, just be careful on what you believe when you see it on mm -hmm. Twitter. Right. Uh, where where would you like to go? We still have folks with their uh, with their thoughts from the question, and we have uh, other stuff that has nothing to do with uh, the question that you posed this morning. Well, let's get caught up on a little bit of uh, show business first. So I'm going to throw a bunch of stuff at you. And okay. if you've got a Google calendar, you might want to take some notes. You might want to write some things down because there's a lot of stuff coming. All right. Okay. Later today, hashtag for the kids. Our youth soccer show is back. Had a chance to catch up with Simon Davey of SSA here in the Atlanta area. Mega club that is adding USL League 2, also adding a WPSL team this summer. So had a chance to talk to Simon about... You know, his growth in the game, his experiences in the game, SSA's growth, and why League Two and why WPSL, why does it fit and, and make SSA even bigger than it already is. Crumpets and Espresso will be coming out later today, too, probably early in the evening. So that's your preview of all the soccer outside of the United States. So there'll be plenty of things to talk about from the first week in Mexico and looking ahead to week two. Lots of things in Europe to get into. Be on the lookout for that on your podcatchers. Those will both come out later today. Scarves, store, all of that is still available. Scarves, shoot us a message if you want to get one. They're $20. You can get them at one of our events. You can also have it shipped to you for an extra $5. Shoot us a message on your social media network of choice, and we'll get you taken care of. If you go to SoccerDownHere.net, there is a link to our Teespring store. All of these different things, whether you're buying a shirt, a scarf, one of the mugs on the Teespring store, a hoodie, all that goes back into growing what we're doing here on SDH. Speaking of merch, we're going to have hats coming pretty soon, eh? Yeah, we are. We've been uh, staring at them and going through the uh, 
the uh, development stage for those, and they're, they're looking pretty sweet, if uh, I do say so myself. But uh, those will be uh, trotting around pretty quickly, and those will be available as well. I, be- I believe they're the trucker variety is what we're going to be having. Yes, and uh, we will have a pre-sale coming up very soon on those. Once we have an idea of when we'll have them in hand, we'll, we'll launch a pre-sale. That's going to be pretty limited. There's not a huge supply, so if you are interested, you might want to get ready for that one. Okay, one of the things that these things help us do more of is provide more content to you. And one brand new thing that we're going to start this spring is a high school soccer game of the week. And we're going to cover the boys and the girls. And we have the the plan to do one every week of the high school season leading into the, the state tournament. Uh, we have a game booked. We have one booked, our first high school soccer game booked. You want to drop that one, John? Well, it's uh, we get to go to Blairsville. And that was uh, that was a, a fun one to to put together to be able to go outside the. <laughs> Perfect timing when when John's going to drop some knowledge. Uh, he he disappears for a minute. There he is. Sorry, sorry. It was a potential spam. <laughs> no, well, there uh, you that go. Was, that was the caller ID, sir. Yes. No. It was. Uh, no, just uh, when you're able to spread your wings a little bit, and I know that from our time in covering the, the GHSA soccer championships last year down in Macon, we got to see what it means to communities outside the city of Atlanta and things like that. But Friday, April 3rd, East Hall in Union County in Blairsville. So Friday, April 3rd, we'll be in Blairsville to catch up with Union County as they host the Vikings of East Hall. So we'll be doing both uh, the girls and boys games there on April third. We've got uh, we've got a, a grid. We've got some folks in the in the bullseye that we're going to be chasing. But it will not be just Atlanta specific. We do have some thoughts to uh, try to get outside the city and uh, call some matches. But Friday, April third, East Hall at Union County. Looking forward to seeing everybody in Blairsville. Yeah, it's the first one on the board. Uh, you'll be able to listen to those just like you listen to the show on the app, on SoccerDownHere.net, live on Spreaker. Uh, You'll also be able to listen to it on demand. So we are scheduling games. We have a schedule we are working from to start, and the idea is to start the first week of the season, Tuesday, February 4th. And we'll let you know once games get booked and once they come online where we will be. It's something that's never been done, first off. Um, You know, there's been very little high school radio coverage of soccer in Georgia ever. Uh, We know Vidalia did the state championship last year. I don't know how many regular season games Vidalia had on on local radio. There's probably been a few others, but extremely minimal. And there's never been a game of the week on, on TV or anything like that. So trying to, I think, bring something different and also an element of soccer in the state of Georgia that has grown a ton and has had some of that effect from the growth of Atlanta United and in South Georgia Tormenta and and other clubs along the way, but an element that's critical, not just because of the players, because there's talent here. A lot of these players are going to go on and play in college at various levels. Potentially some can go on and play professionally, But this is the lifeblood of the growth of the game. You know, for a lot of these players, this is going to be the biggest game that they play in. And if they get to a state championship like Union County did last year, this is going to be huge for them. And and we want to be able to talk about that and and talk about these stories, uh, the growth of the game in, in Union County, a school that we didn't expect to see in the state championships last year. A team that was a lot of fun to watch. So we're, we're going to try to hit some different stories, not just in the metro area, but high school game of the week starting in February. April 3rd is the first official booking East Hall at Union County. February and that 15th. Was, that was fun. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's because that was fun to sit there. It's, it's going to be fun to piece the schedule together. But now to sit there and, and have somebody sit there and say, yeah, come on over. Fantastic to hear. February 15th is our season preview event. 
We're going to be back at Wild Heaven at West End. It's going to be a lunchtime event, so tentative scheduled from 12 to 2. We're also working on some other elements beforehand. Uh, We're working on a coaching clinic for parents. Not about coaching licensing, not about going out and coaching games, not about tactics, but things you can do with your kids at home to work on individual skills. The, the idea of soccer starts at home. We want to kind of touch on that and, and involve some of that in, in the discussion on that day, as well as get you set for first game for Atlanta United officially against Matagua a couple days later. So Saturday, February 15th, this is our big season kickoff event, Wild Heaven West End lunchtime. Come down, have a beer. There's going to be a special beer that is in honor of the Matagua series. Uh, I think I think the working title, and this might be official now, um, El Jefe Jefe. So it is a okay. Hefeweizen that is brewed with fruit native to Honduras. Oh, wow. So uh, the brewmaster has been all over this. It's been a lot of fun talking to our friends down at Wild Heaven preparing for this. So February 15th, put that down on the board. Many of the SDH All-Stars will be on hand for that one. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we'll have a fantasy league as well this year, sponsored again by the Jason Wright Agency. We'll have updates on that coming. We're, we're waiting on a little bit from MLS because that's where we've hosted the fantasy league in the past. And I know last year it was kind of late right before the season that they dropped how it was, everything was going to work. So we're hoping it's a little bit earlier this time around to give you more time to sign up. But we're going to do some fantasy MLS previews along the way, give you some Players to watch, players who have left the league so you don't put them in your lineup, like some people on the show. (laughs) Uh, We'll get you updated on all that. But that'll be coming as we get into February, and we'll have the league announcement very, very soon. So, uh, nope, there's one more. There's one more. We have so many things going on right now. Uh, We will be doing, and we've talked about it before, we don't have the name completely official yet, but our (laughs) night before shows uh, at the Brewhouse Cafe... The night before every Atlanta United home game, we'll have our preview show. Uh, It'll be a little bit different format than we've done in the past. Kelly Francis and John will be hosting those. Uh, I'll be part of it along with some special guests that we're working on at at different events. We're going to have some special guests that are revolving around the opponent come into town. We've also got some just special guests in general that are going to be pretty cool. So, those are going to be a lot of fun. There's one of them in the season that, that we can't do the Saturday before Sunday game because there's a twos game that night. It'll be the Friday night. We'll keep you posted on all these as they come out. But we'll be putting event reminders out over on our Facebook page, Soccer Down Here on Facebook. Go ahead and, and like it and, and make sure you're getting all the information from us there. Uh, but we'll have all of our events coming up very soon on there. There's a ton of stuff coming. So... All that is coming because of support from people like our sponsor of the night before show, Steve Apolinski, like Jason Wright, sponsoring our Fantasy League, like all of you who have bought scarves, bought hoodies, bought mugs, bought T-shirts, and will buy trucker hats. Because you know it's going to happen. So thanks to all of you for for allowing this to happen, and we're going to keep growing it and keep doing more stuff. And high school soccer game of the week is going to be a lot of fun this spring. Yeah, and uh, do not forget that we are also still going to be at the brew house on Mondays, right? Yep, yep. There's going to be a lot of soccer talking this year. Not, nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, then really, as we get really geared into this season, which, and it, it, you think about it, and we're heading into year four of the network. Yes. And it has flown by. I, I honestly, you, you sit there and you think about it, and it's like, wow, it's been we're starting on almost starting our fourth year of, of the network here. And it's just, it really has flown by. And we can't thank everybody enough who listens on a daily basis and catches up with us on a daily basis, stops us in the gulch, stops us at games, wants to catch up with us and just, uh, you know, shake hands and, yeah, we couldn't have done it without you guys, but uh, we still got a lot of work to do. And uh, game of the week is the the next part of this whole thing, and it's 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 fun to piece it together. 
Yep, and there will be lots of piecing together. And if you have, once we start to get the schedule firmed up, if you have a, a local business who you want to get on board sponsoring that game, sponsoring some advertising elements of these games, uh, once the schedule's out, please reach out and let us know because that's how we can afford to do this stuff. It's uh, It's a lot of... Uh, gas money and food money and equipment and time and all of it. So uh, we will keep you posted on how you can help grow that. And over time, we want to add video. We want to make that even bigger. We want to do more and more with it. But it's the right time to get it started. So high school game of the week on Soccer Down Here will be starting in February. All right. We have more folks who have contributed to the Friday question. Let's get into Friday stuff. Shiva, having more academy, pre-academy, recreational programs, and camps available for kids and youth. I talked to high school or college students that often mention there were not many options 10 or 15 years ago when they were in elementary for them to get into a soccer program. 100%. And, I mean, go back to the, the high school conversation for a second. When when you get into some areas that don't have as much academy and, and local leagues to play in, you can see the difference. And it's a shame. But even in those areas now, things have grown dramatically. To see you know, Union County in the state finals last year, to see Vidalia on the girls' side in the state finals, Thomasville, to see parts of the state that you might not expect to be developing high school teams at that kind of level, it's very cool. Metro area, you know, even there, it's grown deeper than it ever has. I mean your Fayette County schools are still very, very strong and they've had a thriving youth culture, you know, for decades now and it continues to to reinvent itself. And it has to, because you have all kinds of different elements right now in the youth game. You have the the huge giant clubs with big resources like SSA that'll be on our hashtag for the kids show later today. You have clubs like impact that that we've talked to in the past that are more local you have clubs that fulfill you know a niche and and kind of hit a a smaller element whether it's a smaller community whether it's focusing on different things futsal is becoming a, a bigger element of this too so there's just so many different things happening there's so many different options all of that builds on itself because then when those players go on to play either at top-level youth clubs, high school, go on to college, they have a stronger base of knowledge than the previous generation. I mean, for people who will try to tell you that American soccer players are not as good as they used to be, they're wrong. In general, they're completely and utterly wrong. Not talking about one player who was uh, once in a lifetime a great player. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the overall picture. There are more players at a higher level in the United States today than there have ever been in this country. And in 10 years, we'll look back at 2020 and say, man, there was nothing like it is now in 2030 in terms of the number of players that are available and the quality. So it's only going to continue to grow from here. And uh, another piece of programming news uh, this weekend, it, it normally we do 1v1s. I guess this one's technically a 3v1 where uh, I caught up. Yeah, I know. But still, uh, the three Tormenta FC Academy players, Savannah Natives, Tristan Deloach, Grand Hampton, Stephen O'Hearn, caught up with each one of them. Now that uh, they have signed their contract to be a part of Tormenta FC, we have uh, caught up with each one of them as they've signed their academy contracts and with the club's USL League One team, of course, pending League and Federation approval. But we caught up with the three local guys who've signed contracts to be a part of Tormenta. And uh, Tormenta also has announced their preseason plans today as well. And what so are that'll they? Be out, that'll be out this weekend. So the 3v1 will be out this weekend. No, but no, what their are the plan, preseason plans? <laughs> the preseason plans, uh, they kick off preseason against Charlotte Independence. And I guess they kind of split the difference. It's going to be in Columbia, South Carolina, February 12th. Ten days later in Tampa to take on the Rowdies. On the 28th, Charleston visits Irk Russell Park. So it will be a first peek at uh, the new-look Charleston Battery. Then March 14th, 
uh, at the clubhouse fields, Lander University visits, and then on the 21st, Young Harris visits the clubhouse fields in Statesboro. So it is a five-match preseason schedule, the 12th, 22nd, 28th, March 14th, and 21st. There you go. And uh, Tormenta, if you did not see the the video, they are, are laying down the asphalt for the uh, the stadium and the complex that's being built. So they're getting everything done piecemeal, and it's uh, getting done a piece at a time. And it's going to be fun to see everything evolve for uh, Tormenta's new complex as it continues to grow as well. Excellent. Yeah, that's going to be a huge development for soccer in the state. All right, so let's see what else uh, folks have uh, wanted to talk about this morning. Bartimus Prime says on the hashtag Friday Free For All, <laughs> he says the franchise player rule. Each MLS team can designate two players as a franchise player, re-sign them to contracts above the max budget charge, but less than a million dollars. Any salary over the max charge does not count, but TAM can be used. Hmm. I need to look at this in writing from, from Bartimus Prime to fully understand it because I don't dislike the idea when I hear it that way. So this is his suggestion for a new rule to MLS. Yes. Two players are franchise players. You can basically do the, the bird rules. You can re-sign them to contracts above the max budget charge, but less than a million. So you would be putting a cap on it to a degree. This would be really useful for guys who are coming out of your academy that you're signing like to. Call, to he suggests. Yeah, uh, it'd be guys like that that are not quite in that big, big money phrase yet, but you might be able to keep guys before they play their contract out and go sign overseas. There's benefits to it. Um, he suggests Toronto signing Bradley in present day as well. Hmm. with the new contract it it feels i would i would gear it towards the younger guys and i would probably write that into the rules because it it feels like just another way to use tam and and i know in in bart's tweet he says you can't use tam in this it's it's kind of like an in-between of tam and a designated player i would make it specific to players that you developed players that started their professional career with you maybe maybe that's how you phrase it that they are a franchise player and you can re-sign them and i wouldn't put a limit on it honestly I, if if i'm gonna put the limit on which players i can use it on that they started their pro career with you then i'm not gonna limit the amount of money they would have a you'd, you'd come up with a cap hit i wouldn't go to the max cap hit God, now I'm almost trying to think of like the NFL franchise tag in a way, and it doesn't necessarily apply. Um, find a number. That's what it is. It'd be more than a young designated player, but it wouldn't be a max cap hit. Maybe it's 250. Maybe it's 300. And if they started their pro career with you, you can resign them to whatever above that. You pay the difference above that, so it's kind of designated player-ish, but that'll allow you to have flexibility in keeping guys. And it doesn't make the the bird rule idea unlimited where you can just go over the cap to resign your own players. It puts some limitations on that idea. I'm good with it. I, I like, I like it in that way. I don't know if it would be as effective to use in, in cases like Bradley, because then it just feels like a different way to do Tam kind of stuff. If you get rid of Tam, then maybe this rule has more value. But if in the current scenario, I would gear it more towards signing guys that you developed. Sean Vergara has a question. Okay. Is today the day for Viasanti? <laughs> uh, I don't know. He's he's busy right now at the uh, U23 South American Olympic qualifying tournament. So I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. So... Don't know if it's going to happen. Don't know if it happens today. I would probably say that it's least likely to happen today. I just don't know why it would be today rather than any other day. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. I mean, there's still a lot of moving parts here. So this is one that the last update uh, Roberto Rojas has shared with people, and this is what I've seen out of Paraguayan media as well, 
is, you know, their agent and Arzamendia and Viasanti both have the same agent and they're both at the same club, Cedro Porteño. The offers from unnamed MLS teams are supposedly making their way to Cedro Porteño either yesterday or today. And I guess the agent is involved in making that happen, which is typical for a lot of clubs where the agent really does a lot of the heavy lifting on on finding the location for their clients to go to in this situation. So, you know, all of it sounds fairly legit at this point. We just don't know if it's one club after both, because there's been confusion about that, if it's different clubs after each one, if there's multiple offers from different clubs if there's two or three MLS clubs interested in Viasanti and two or three of the same or different interested in Arzamendia, we don't know. So there's so much unknown that I'm not going to say today's the day. I have no way to say that. Herschel Skywalker this morning. Some MLS team could get and probably really use Bobby Wood. He could be good in this league. Is probably gettable and willing at this point. Seems like a no-brainer for many. Maybe not Atlanta United, though. No, there's no way to come to Atlanta United because he's not going to play. And there would be no point in him going somewhere that he's not going to play. So he is at Hamburg in the second division in Germany right now. Transfer marks got him valued at just over a million dollars. So if you're an MLS team, yeah, that's that's affordable. You probably have to pay a little bit more than that to get him. But if you're talking about paying... Three, four million. He's 27 years old. Um, according to Transfer Mark, he's under contract through the summer of 21. So if you were to, let's say, pay $4 million, sign him to a four year deal, you could TAM him. You could make it fit under current TAM rules. And he's a guy who has shown at different points in his career the ability to score goals. Uh, I think there's still a lot of questions about what his overall level is. But when you look around MLS teams that need goal scorers, Minnesota comes to mind straight away. Potentially Houston, but I think Christian Ramirez will be the guy when Mauro Minotas departs. Minnesota feels like the club that would be a no-brainer here because they need somebody, and if they were able to get somebody that doesn't take up an international slot, that's even better. I think they'd be a perfect fit. And if they don't get Luis Amaria and Woods interested in coming to the U.S., which is the, the major part of this, he'd be a, a good one to bring in. I think maybe even a club like Real Salt Lake would be one to look at here because yeah. you know Sam Johnson didn't really live up to the hype last year. If you're able to fit him under the cap, that would give you one more option up top as a number nine if Sam Johnson doesn't cut it this year. So those are the two that I look at, um, and I'd lean pretty hard to Minnesota. I think they should be looking here. It would make sense. Michael Head with an unrelated topic. Tomorrow, Chelsea has their longest away trip in the Premier League at Newcastle and with uh, Miguel Almiron at 283 miles compared to Atlanta. The closest trip is to Nashville, 288 miles. Most international pundits do not recognize the challenge of MLS travel. The league needs to schedule better to mitigate it. There's only so much you can do to mitigate it, but yeah, it it is something that needs to be thought of more when scheduling. I agree. The the bigger thing here is just when people look at MLS and look at the challenges of MLS, yeah, they don't consider that. I mean, Atlanta United hasn't had a a close travel partner until Nashville, and they'll have an even closer one with Charlotte. But before that, your your closest trip was Orlando and Columbus. It's not close. Uh, You've got Miami that'll be making long trips. You've got Vancouver that makes long trips. The teams, you know, in the corners are going to be making some of these really long trips from time to time. It affects your training schedule. It affects everything. I think from an MLS perspective, I wish that when they're they're making their their weeks that have midweeks midweek matches, they avoid the longer trips. Then those are the ones that okay, maybe you don't want to put your close rivalry game on a Wednesday. I get that you don't want to hurt attendance for what could be one of your biggest games, but maybe get your next one or your next one. 
you know, keep it reasonable. Like, don't do what Atlanta had to last year, where you're at home on Sunday, you're in Vancouver on Wednesday, and then you're at Red Bull Arena on the following Sunday. There's just no need for that. The game in Vancouver, you could have had any of your other road games that were closer. Chicago. You could have put something else in there. It, things like that. And I hope that's where MLS starts to get better down the road. Scheduling's hard. It's tricky because you have a lot of moving parts. But that's something that should be more of a consideration. Cassie went back to the question this morning for the Friday flashback. And the question was, and it was phrased, what has been the most impactful in the growth of American soccer since the 1994 World Cup? Kefsi would add 1999, 2015, and 2019 with three trophy emojis behind have been impactful. That's the whole point here. It wasn't about the U.S. doing something in the World Cup. It was about hosting the World Cup. So the U.S. women have been incredibly impactful in the growth of American soccer since the World Cup. But the, the idea here is soccer in the United States going in at this time in 1994 was, it's not non-existent, but the level that we see it at today, yeah, it's, it's hardly recognizable. That's the, the element here. You didn't have a professional women's league. The league you had at that time was the American Professional Soccer League. I don't know if they were even going by the A-League name at that point. The number one team in that league was the Seattle Sounders. They went 14-6 and six in a 20-game regular season. That's it. Number two team was the LA Salsa, who were out of business going into 95. Montreal Impact were number three. Colorado Foxes were number four. They went out of business in 98. Eight. I think they did play a 97. Fort Lauderdale Strikers, number five. That version of the Strikers went out of business after the 94 season. Vancouver 86ers, which turned into the current iteration of the Vancouver Whitecaps. So that one continued. And the Toronto Rockets, which was on the schedule in 95 and went out of business before games got played. So your landscape in 94... One, two, three of the teams that were in the biggest professional league you had, three of the seven were out of business before the next season. That was what it looked like at this time in 94. It's, I'm not saying you know that other things were more important than the women. Don't get me wrong here. The, the women's development is as impactful as anything in American soccer development. I'm saying... There's a clear delineation between hosting the 94 World Cup before and after. It's night and day. And and what's happened since that's been impactful. The women have been a huge part of that. I would add the 96 Olympics to that. Because maybe that was just a big deal here in, in our neck of the woods. But that was a big important element here because the 91 women's world cup win it wasn't on tv i think it was on tape delay on like sports channel and the games were in china in the middle of the night like nobody talked about them from a national media perspective you had to really look hard to find it 96 olympics and again we were here when it happened so it's probably a little more direct for us Now, those games weren't on TV either, and that's a huge miss from NBC at the time. They could have done much better with that, and I think they would have benefited from it because people were interested. But the 96 Olympics was part of it on the women's side, and that was the perfect prelude to hosting the 99 Women's World Cup. But you would not have gotten a 99 Women's World Cup if you hadn't had the Men's World Cup in 94. You know, the the U.S. was not part of FIFA's hosting cycle for anything, period. And 99 was an absolute no-brainer after the success of the, the U.S. women on the field and after the financial success of the 94 World Cup off the field. So those elements were key. 96, 99, you lump those together. Those are the players who inspired the 2015 and 2019s. And, and I think something that needs to be 
mentioned more is I think a lot of the discussion around the women's game is, you know, oh, they, they inspire young girls. They inspire young boys, too. Mm-hmm. That part needs to be left out because there are there are men's players who inspire young girls and there are female players who inspire young boys. Period. You know, I I watched Mia Hamm when I was still playing, you know, rec league and adult league and I watched Mia Hamm and, and how she could cut back and forth and I tried to do things that she could do. Absolutely. Now, I was in college at the time. Young kids boys and girls are going to look at great players and want to play like them. So the effect of the, the women, it's not just on other women. It's on the game as a whole. And that's a, a huge part of it. That's one of the most impactful things. It's not about that was the jump off point. I think the jump off point was 94 world cup, but that's a huge impactful element of it. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, how many, how many guys, and it's either folks who played the sport or didn't play the sport, with the success of the women's national team, would wear a Mia Hamm jersey, would wear uh, a Brandy Chastain jersey? No, I, know. I, 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 I saw many. it, but not yeah, not many. Let, let's be real. More need to, and yes. more need to be available for people to. And yes. that's a part of the problem here is that they're not available. And the U.S. soccer and Nike have never done an effective job of marketing the women's national team because that should be more common. It's hard to do because you have to find them in men's sizes or you have to find them, period. That's ridiculous. These, these things would sell. Put them out there. Yeah. The, the women's game is not just on the women's side. It's part of soccer. And, and I think that is the unique element about soccer that no other sport truly has. You know, basketball has it to a degree, but the games are, are different. There's a different feel between men's basketball and women's basketball. There's not nearly the different feel between men's soccer and women's soccer. Maybe volleyball falls into this as well, but on, on a major, major level, I think these are the games that are the most similar. And you're going to get some numpties out there that are going to say things like they did during the Women's World Cup and, and all the nonsense that people will say. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who actually know the game and pay attention closely. You're seeing coaching developments on the women's side. You're seeing developments in technique. You're seeing some amazing play. This last World Cup was a blast to watch. It was entertaining. It was good soccer, had drama to it. There were there was so much going on. It was so competitive. It was outstanding. You don't get there if you don't have what happened in 2015. And for the U.S., you don't get there if you don't have what happened in 96 and 99. It's another part of that time that it just generations have built up over time through all of these experiences. But I, I, I do feel like the 94 World Cup happening is that pre and post marker. You know, the game was very small before that. It couldn't be that small anymore after it. Did you get the chance, and this is uh, another uh, another one on the timeline from Nick Brawley, did you get the chance to see the conversation uh, about the uh, men's national team camp and if it's a sign of yeah. desperation for Greg Berhalter. Yeah, I saw it. I mean, I think the question was, was more about the Atlanta United element of it. It um, was. I feel like the desperation thing and, and the talk about how it's easy to get a call up was a little overplayed. Um, the January camp's always a unique element. And you can't compare it to other camps. And you can't compare this roster to other rosters because it's not a FIFA date. And you're not able to get your Christian Pulisics and others, so you're going to be calling in more guys that are on the fringes of it. It creates an opportunity for players, but it's not the full national team. It's more like a B team because you're missing a lot of guys. So I can't compare a January camp to a regular camp period. Um, in general, with Greg Berhalter, 
it's the same things we've talked about. I mean, there's no, there was nothing new here. He, he's got to settle a little bit more on what his group is, how he's going to play, all those kinds of things that need to get better, no matter who's called in. I don't think he's got this gigantic list of players that he's pulling from based off a of January camp. I don't, I don't put that much stock in it. The Atlanta United element to it, I thought was kind of all over the place in the discussion. Um, you know, I think that there, there is a concern for, you know, the players involved and more specifically Lennon and Robinson, mm -hmm. that this would affect future call-ups. It shouldn't if the national team boss is doing his job, because again, this is not important for these players to be there. It's important to be seen, but it's not important in terms of these players being there instead of preparing for their club season, instead of preparing for CONCACAF Champions League. The game is a friendly against Costa Rica that means nothing. It's not even Canada's situation where they're trying to play their way into the hex based off rankings. So if Greg Berhalter is doing his job, this has zero effect. If he starts to call in other center backs over Miles Robinson that should not be there, he's going to get hammered for it. Now, that's a multifaceted conversation because... Miles Robinson has to play at the level this season to earn that call up. If he does, he should get that call up. There's no there's no reason yet to think that this is going to affect their future. And these situations have happened in the past. But Greg Berhalter is not in a position to play favorites right now. I think he's still got so much work to do to get this program where it needs to go. That if Miles Robinson is the best center back to call in, he needs to call him in. If Brooks Lennon is the best player to call in on the right side, he needs to call him in. He doesn't have the depth and the options and, honestly, I think the the cachet to play that game. So we'll see how it plays out, but I'm a little surprised that more clubs allowed players to go to these events that are outside of a FIFA window. LAFC's got five guys at the South American Olympic qualifying. Um, NYC has let players go to the national team and Olympic qualifying in South America. So, you know, those are two teams that are preparing for their first CONCACAF Champions Leagues. And maybe they think that that's no big deal. Atlanta United was there last year. They want these guys in camp ahead of CONCACAF this year. Now, I, I think what you know, Moreno and, and Gomez said that are, are elements that Atlanta United has to manage well is you have to be on the same page with these players. You have to make sure they understand the reasoning and not letting them go. You have to make sure that, that they're on board with that. Because if they're not, it can be a problem. You know, we've heard nothing from any of the players to make you think that it would be a problem in this case, but it is something to keep in mind. And and yeah, what happened in October with Miles Robinson? Yeah, that probably factors into this a little bit. It probably has something to do with it. Um, that's why Atlanta doesn't want to risk it. So I understand why we are where we are with it. And if, if Burhalter starts not calling guys in because of personal politics, that's a big problem for him because... He doesn't have the track record to pull that off. And the flip side is if the players really wanted to go and that conversation, that communication between the club and the players is not strong, it can create issues. We've seen it in other places. There's been nothing here to indicate that it's an issue. So it, it is what it is. Kefsi, going back into the conversation uh, point that was brought in earlier, Kefsi says, I guess I'm thinking that it's impacting and will impact the game in the country going forward. True enough, it's not just a single thing here. Yeah, no, that's the whole point. It, that's the thing is since the 94 World Cup, what's been impactful? And the women's titles have been incredibly impactful. That's just not the, the start date of pre and post for me. For me, it's the 94 World Cup. It felt like night and day after that. You know, it felt like, oh, soccer's actually on TV now. Uh, soccer's actually going to have a professional league that teams are not going to fold a few weeks before the season starts. You know, it's, it's actually a real thing now. 
and I don't have to work so hard to find it. So that was kind of the the breaking point for me was that felt like when the modern era of American soccer started was hosting the World Cup in 94. So what have been the most impactful things since? The women's championships are absolutely a part of that. Chris Ashley back in. He says, I've never understood the idea that boys wouldn't wear USWNT gear. As a kid who grew up in Knoxville, I can't tell you how many Lady Vols games I attended and how much Lady Vol merch I owned. Pat Summit was one of my heroes. And then in all caps, boys can be fans of female athletics with three exclamation points. Yeah. And, you know, University of Tennessee women's basketball is one of the top programs in the country under Pat Summit. So you had high quality product that people responded to. That's what you have with the U.S. women. I don't think people who are truly fans of those sports really get too worked up if it's men or women that are involved. You've got some that have prejudices that affect everything, not just sports for them. And yeah, that that factors in. You see them, you see it rear its ugly head at times. You saw it during the the Women's World Cup. I saw some comments that I'm just like, okay, I don't know if I'd be putting that out publicly, and you might want to think about that and think about why that looks so bad, but okay, have at it. Um, I think for most, it doesn't matter. Good soccer is good soccer. Mm-hmm. And the, the U.S.-England World Cup semi was a great match. A lot of fun. The, the U.S.-Canada Olympic semi in in 2012 was one of the most entertaining matches i've ever seen the 2015 final was one of the craziest matches i've ever seen there's there's so many the abby wambach goal in 2011 like there there's so many moments that are just great soccer moments don't care if it's the the women or the men involved in it. it's just a great soccer moment and i think a lot of people think that way not everybody i hope more do but yeah it's not just about these great athletes inspiring young girls they're inspiring kids period they're inspiring adults too but they're inspiring people just because it's a female athlete doesn't mean they only inspire young girls and i hope the nwsl gets away from that kind of messaging on a regular basis what else is on your mind before we go uh, that's about it. Um, Tyler Miller's in Minnesota now. Loons had to give up a good bit of allocation money to get his rights from LAFC, which is stupid because mm-hmm. LAFC wasn't going to sign him. But anyway, uh, they had to do it. He's going to be the number one for the Loons. No Vito Minone, no Joe Hart. Mark McKenzie, Ismail Tajori Shradi have signed new multi-year deals. Keep an eye on this one. It's uh, Colorado Rapids signing Argentine winger Brian Galvan from Colon. Colon is saying that they can't sign him to a pre-contract. The Rapids have announced that he'll join the team in July when the secondary transfer window opens, that he's in the last six months of his contract. Colon's disputing it. MLS is back in Colorado. That's why the signing was announced. Keep an eye on that. It'll, it'll get squirrely, but... There's also the potential that Colorado just gets a deal done to go ahead and bring him in. And that might be what Cologne is angling for here, is to try to get some money now to go ahead and get something out of it. Uh, A couple off-the-field things in MLS. In Charlotte, they've appointed Thomas Schalling as the director of scouting. He comes over from PSV Eindhoven, where he helped bring in Irving Lozano, Andres Guardado, uh, he was previously at AZ, where they won their first league title in 28 years while he was there. Uh, three PSV titles while he was at PSV, so he's had success. He's scouted players that have boosted these teams. He goes to Charlotte. That's a, another big hire for Charlotte and David Tepper and what they're working on for their first year in 21. Austin's coming in with them in 21, and they are saying now that they have nearly 40,000 season ticket deposits. They're starting to convert those to season memberships, and they're making progress in selling out the stadium that is being built. So a lot of people looked at Austin as a market that wouldn't be successful. Well, it's looking pretty freaking successful so far. Uh, Rumors that are on the board right now... 
the Agustin Almendra move from Boca Juniors to enter is, is still on. Uh, Toda Pasión in Argentina is reporting that they're negotiating the transfer fee. Probably going to be eight figures. FC Cincinnati, according to Paul Tenorio, will reportedly waive Fernando Adi today. Uh, the way this goes down, and this is back to MLS rules being complicated sometimes. So, they'll waive him. If multiple teams submit a claim, the team willing to pick up the largest amount of Adi's budget charge will get the player. The remaining budget charge would be on Cincinnati's books. The discretionary DP money above the maximum charge would be paid by Cincinnati. If no team picks him up during waivers, then he's available first come, first served. Cincinnati has the option to do the one-time off-season buyout if they want to. They've got up until the roster compliance deadline on February 28th to do that. So looks like Adi's not going to be in Cincinnati, which isn't news, but how it goes down could end up being news. So stay tuned. Still reports out of Seattle, too, that they're chasing Gregore from Bahia in Brazil. Uh, they haven't been able to get this deal done yet, and it's sounding like they're going to give it one more shot. And if it doesn't happen, then they're going to move on. Mentioned Canada a, a minute ago and what they're trying to do to get into the hex. That took a dent when they lost to Iceland in a friendly 1-0. Now, they didn't have their full complement of players because it's outside the FIFA window, but this would have been a big opportunity to pick up points. And you're dealing with the FIFA ranking system because CONCACAF got crazy with how they decided to do the hex this time around. So you have to be in the top six to get in in rankings at the end of June. So they've got two more windows, FIFA windows, to schedule games to get those points. Some of the conversation, because they haven't scheduled games yet, was, well, if they get this win, then maybe they'll schedule easier wins just to rack up easy points because they should be fine. Well, now they've got to find a good opponent that's ranked higher that they can get more points by beating, but they've actually got to beat them. You know, this was a bad loss for Canada in terms of getting to the hex. It's what we talked about going into the match with the U S and Orlando. We thought Canada might come in and be very defensive because a draw there would have been amazing for them because it would have got them into the nation's league semis, but it would have given them a really good result in these FIFA rankings. By losing there and now losing to Iceland, they're in a bad spot. I don't know if they're going to get in. And I think you added a piece over at Sky Sports. Now Premier League referees are going to remember that they have pitch side monitors? Yeah, apparently they so. they remember that those things are actually sitting over there? Yeah. it's. Uh, I thought that that was interesting when that came across this morning. And... If uh, my computer would behave, I could actually you know, discuss it with you. But uh, I got it. No so pitch. Sky Sports News has confirmed that referees will start using the pitch side monitors from this weekend if VAR recommends changing a decision on a red card. So just right. on that, not on penalties, no. just on a red card. So if you give a yellow and the VAR comes back and says, hey, that's a red and this is yeah. why – the ref is being instructed to go over and look at the monitor. Um, yep. Or if it's a red and the VAR says, no, it should be a yellow, they're going to go and take a look. But that's the only scenario they're going to go take a look. Yeah, I'm so glad they're going to do to... that, but it makes no sense that they're not going to look at penalties as well. Yeah, so it's upgrade, downgrade, and that is it. Anything that's a judgment decision, they should go look at. If it's not a judgment decision like offside, they don't need to go look. If there's a judgment, they should go look. If they feel like they should go look. I mean, you don't have to go look at everything. If if you had a question when you made the call and the VAR is like, well, it should be this, and you're like, yeah, I kind of thought it might be that. I'm with you. Let's go. Fine. But in a case where you know there's there's any kind of a question, go take a look and get the call right. That's all you need. No pitch side monitor had been used in nearly 220 Premier League games. Michael Oliver used a monitor in the FA Cup tie between Crystal Palace and Derby this month. It's dumb. Stop trying to make your own rules. Actually look at what's working in, in other leagues and, and learn from it. You guys can get off the, the high horse in this regard. 
and, and actually try to get it right. And I hope that the Premier League does. This is a small step in the right direction. Minnesota United has just announced that they've signed defensive midfielder James Musa after two seasons with Phoenix. So he's uh, going to be added to their roster as they head to camp. Yeah, you're seeing more USL Championship guys make the move up. So this is good. You're seeing money go towards USL Championship in this. This is very good. Uh, You're also seeing this morning Orlando City opening their new training ground. Um, I believe it is the old... Houston Astros facility in Kissimmee. Oh, wow. Osceola Heritage Park, um, which I've been to before. Uh, I mean, for a baseball facility, it's great. You can reimagine it as a soccer facility, but they'll be in a dedicated place. So good step for Orlando as they're starting to figure things out eventually. Just took a while. Yes. I think that's a show, sir. That's the show. So we've got a lot of stuff coming later today. Youth show coming up in the afternoon. Crumpets and espresso early evening. We've got a Tormenta special coming up this weekend as well. And then all kinds of things coming. And next week, everybody will be in training camp in MLS. You're going to get lots of moves, lots of talk, lots of chatter. We'll be on top of all of it for you starting on Monday at 9. So have a great weekend. Mucha plot, y'all. Mucha plot.